Uh, thank you all for joining us on this uh, third day of uh, Charcha 2020, uh, online convening uh, largest of its kind dialogue between the development sector. So it's been two days of wonderful discussions on a variety of topics. And uh, within the fundraising and philanthropy track, which we've been focused on, we've talked a lot about what investors, funders, philanthropists, uh, NGOs can do to address this crisis that we're all facing. Uh, and today we're really going to focus on the role of the government uh, and specifically how civil society and NGOs can effectively partner with the government. That is really uh, essential for service delivery and this new normal pretty much requires that sort of collaboration. So this is what this uh, panel discussion is about. Uh, we're very, very fortunate. We've got a fantastic panel with us of uh, five leading experts uh, who are experts in this topic. And uh, what I'm going to do is rather than, you know, frame the discussion uh, too much, I think it's a topic that uh, all of the NGOs certainly appreciate. And now the government also appreciates. We've got two representatives here uh, from civil society as well, who have directly been working with governments and partnering with NGOs. So what I would like to do uh, with your permission is to sort of go, uh, uh, you know, one by one and request each of our five panelists here to share perspectives on what their organization has been doing and how do they really answer this, uh, this critical question of, uh, you know, uh, how does government leverage A, the capacity and B, the delivery models of the NGOs, both for short-term relief, whether it's food, shelter, cash, or medium to long-term uh, service delivery. And of course, to the most vulnerable and effective, uh, affected segments of the society. So we'll start first with Sudha. Uh, welcome Sudha. And Sudha is of course, uh, the CEO of the Nudge Foundation and uh, or rather the Nudge Center for Social Innovation, uh, who are one of the organizers, the main organizer of this conference. So thank you for uh, capitalizing all of this. Uh, Sudha has been leading NCORE and related initiatives to attract and develop top talent uh, working on problems of poverty. Uh, she has worked in the technology sector for 16 years in various leadership roles, uh, spanning operations, engineering, and organizational development, but, all, but uh, always had a passion to scale up, uh, uh, you know, social development and been attracted to the sector. Uh, she is an engineer and an IIM, uh, uh, an MBA from IIM Lucknow. Uh, and with that, Sudha, uh, I'd like to hand it over to you and specifically ask you to focus on uh, this issue of, uh, you know, Given all the work that you guys do with NGOs, what are the best examples of innovations from the private sector, right? That can improve public systems. And at this time, when the funding from the, you know, the private sources is drying up, CSR is uh, getting reduced, what is, where is this instruction going to come from? So we'd love Absolutely. to hear your perspectives Sita, on the role of civil society and examples that have worked and not worked. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Karthik, for setting the stage and real honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I struggled with the framing of this a little bit uh, because, yes, uh, I think civil society has jumped in a very big way by way of emergency response and relief activity in the wake of COVID, and that has been appreciated by the government a lot. This is very powerful. It happens at scale, but not because there are institutions with capacity for service delivery but because Indian civil society has a certain ethos and core values of service. Regular citizens step up when there is a crisis and it can be a COVID crisis or the Kerala floods or a funny cyclone, whatever natural or man-made disaster it is. These values come to fore and very quickly get activated. Uh, just in the past few weeks, we've seen COVID heroes like Kushru Pocha who runs Seva Kitchen in Pune and jumped in to distribute meals went without uh, you know, going to sleep for five days, I hear. Uh, and then we saw startups figure out how to distribute uh, PPEs and do sanitation training on the fly. The reason this works every time is because there's a distributed ability to solve problems at a very local level through motivated people who have the agency to act. And it manifests in a very positive way every time. But there's a different kind of emergency that's not quite the same. It's not about the drowning child, but about the underfed child, the child who's not learning sufficiently at school or will grow up without gender sensitization or life skills to be self-reliant in the 21st century. It isn't quite as dramatic as a drowning child where you can quickly roll up your sleeves and jump into the river. 
but this child also needs solutions with the same urgency because for them the clock is ticking. Uh, there's a point beyond which any help will be too late. That threshold is five years when it comes to nutrition. As we all know, stunting and wasting cannot be rever reversed beyond that point. Uh, and similarly, there are thresholds in learning and substance abuse beyond which you cannot help that person. So it is just as urgent. And these are not problems for civil society to solve uh, in the distributed manner that we see relief work happening. This requires institutional investment and capacity for service delivery. And you see it works in a lot of areas like education, health, where nonprofits have seen their roles as innovators and problem solvers. And we have a show who will speak later at, I'm sure, about the immense work that Akshara Foundation's done. Uh, basically helping government or public systems improve. And the engine for scale there is the public system. Um, and in the recent times, we've seen so much more work in this kind of model. We've seen technology startups starting to disrupt critical government systems. There's Kushi Baby that's plugged into the Nirogi Rajasthan scheme uh, uh, to extend the reach of immunization programs and maternal health care. Uh, we have organizations like People and Transform and Madhi in Tamil Nadu. Uh, that are improving the quality of service delivery in education. This Education Alliance in Delhi, which I'm sure uh, those of you working in Delhi are familiar with, that has convened a wide array of solutions through the nonprofit private innovation world. But what's changing with COVID is the funding landscape for these kind of nonprofits. With each one of these that has improved public systems, uh, you'll find that they are themselves privately funded, mostly through foundations and CSR. And we all know that in FY21, they'll be required to do 10x the work with one tenth the funding. CSR, of course, is likely to go down as a total corpus of available money because, uh, let's face it, all corporates won't be as profitable this year as they were uh, in the past. And even that, the little money that will be available will be directed towards the immediate needs of COVID relief, not for systems change and capacity building. International funding will also reduce because uh, COVID unfortunately is a global problem, affects the developed world as much as it has affected us. So in this scenario, we're really seeing uh, the very survival of such nonprofits at risk. So if the government is serious about innovating for the bottom 250 million, and I'm sure it is, then the direction to take with a great sense of urgency is to ensure funding for innovative nonprofits solving problems with the purity of intent. There's a strong analogy to be made with what happened with privatization of several sectors a couple of decades ago. In the early 2000s, you saw privatiza privatization was the means to infuse innovation in sectors like aviation and banking, where there was money to be made. Today, it's time for nonprofits to be you know, seen as the leaders of such innovation and to let them into the public system. So while it's an analogy, it's the opposite. Right? Public systems need to provision the programmatic funding needs of such nonprofits and not let it be picked up. Uh, I mean, there is no CSR to pick it up, right? And that's what we're dealing with. So this way, the capacity for innovation continues. And that innovation can be infused into public systems and sustained in an environment where this private funding is driving up really fast. Uh, government also needs to enable this inflection with the same urgency that it drove uh, changes to the ease of business norms. Right? We need to improve uh, the ease of doing business with government for the nonprofit sector as well. And do it in a manner that brings greater transparency, accountability, and quality to public systems, be it education, sanitation, health, across the board. And I think these are the necessary conditions for us uh, to be able to do the 10x amount of work that's required, uh, even if 
philanthropic capital is not going to scale up uh, for this kind of demand. So that I kind of hand it back to you, Karthik. Uh, no, thank you, Sudha. Thank you, Sudha, for putting that so eloquently. I think, uh, you know, there's not that analogy. The ease of doing business, just like we've done that in sectors in the past for the private sector, the NGO sector also needs to be enabled and catalyzed. And for that, there needs to be a buy-in. And, and, and the, really, the question is, how do we, how do, we do that? So with that, uh, we'll come to uh, Viraj. Uh, just a quick introduction first to, to, to Viraj. He is the CEO of the eGov e Foundation. Uh, Viraj is passionate about the impact and Jugal Bandi, as he puts it, of uh, public digital platforms, policies, and ecosystems in sol solving complex social issues at scale in an integrated manner, at scale and at speed. Uh, uh, prior to joining uh, eGov, Viraj, uh, Viraj has been an entrepreneur and a, and a senior corporate leader with a large range of businesses, both in Europe uh, and in India. Uh, EGA Foundation, many of you guys would be uh, familiar with. It is doing a lot of uh, very interesting work across the board with multiple governments, really in uh, sort of trying to transform urban governance using scalable and replicable technology solutions, uh, working with different municipal operations to you know, improve their decision making and, uh, and, and, and improve service delivery uh, using as much technology as possible. So, so, so Viraj, thank you very much for being with us. Given the nature of the work that you do and the nature of the topic of this panel, uh, I'd love to, you know, hear from you as to specifically in the last six weeks, what have you guys been focused on? Uh, I know that uh, there's this digit platform that you guys uh, have announced, and uh, could you talk to us a little bit, not just about that, but overall, yes. uh, given the nature of your work, how are state governments responding to this? Uh, what sort of interventions are you seeing? And how optimistic are you and you know your prognosis for as we come out of this lockdown um, for, for good public private collaboration cool okay yeah and i think uh, uh, it's it's very interesting uh Sudha, what you said about you know uh public uh public, uh, 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 public. hello hello i think i'm getting a bit of a feed hello can you hear me hello can you hear me Yes, Mira, we can hear you clearly. I'm getting some uh, uh, echo. Hello, it's better now. That's I fine. Okay, so I think uh, uh, it's it's very interesting. I'm very new to the sector, less than four years. Uh, in fact, uh, Sandeep, I worked with Delhi Dialogue Commission in 2015 when Ashish Khetan was there, but for nine months, did some work on policy on water and beverage. Uh, and I think uh, I came from a tech startup, uh, so I, I had this innate belief that tech can solve a lot of problems. Uh, four years in, I think uh, I'm wiser and uh, I think I've got a bit more gray hair. I think uh, I would like to qualify. I think our, our kind of theory of change has moved from saying tech can solve it to say, saying tech has to be a foundational layer and then policy and ecosystem has to play a pivotal role for things to happen. I'll give you some learnings we've had in the last four weeks, uh, how creating foundational infra helps uh, solve problems at speed. But uh, I think uh, where I lose sleep these days is that we've got uh, a platform which can potentially go national with, with central government and with the state government. But where is the local contextual problem solving on that to really make the you know, solutions uh, you know, live? Because given the complexity of uh, and the diversity of problems we have, you know, nobody can, not, no organization or set of organization can solve it. Uh, so Aparna, if you can just, uh, I just want to show a couple of slides just to, uh, and then I'll talk about COVID in, in, in uh, specifically, if you can share that. So yeah, I think that's what, I think uh, uh, public digital platforms for transformation at scale, scale and speed. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. And this is a problem we're trying to solve, you know, uh, uh, how can we transform governance through an open digital infra for 2000 cities and towns by 2020? And initially, I think first, we, we are a 17 year old organization, I would say first 13, 14 years, we would just focus on tech. But as we move forward, uh, if you can flip to the next slide, I'm gonna just... And that's what, that's what our mantra is now, it is, we feel technology is a, perhaps a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition to, you know, drive uh, complex, uh, solve complex societal challenges. And we use this term, Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar, uh, Sudha, you also alluded to it. And uh, I would say 
you know, today almost 60% of energy is actually in non-tech, really working with governments on not just uh, what technology they should use, but what kind of, you know, program structures they should have, what kind of reforms they should look at uh, with the people in uh, non-profit sector on, you know, driving local policies changes or local adoption uh, through uh, last mile or first mile, uh, you know, people who were really uh, intermeshed with the local societies and obviously market players, uh, because uh, we do think, uh, you know, market players need to play some role here, but some of the policy frameworks and the foundational infra should be there uh, so that uh, some other, it's, it becomes a level, level playing field rather than trying to, you know, have a uh, land grab. Uh, so I think if you go to the next slide, I'll just uh, briefly tell you. So if you see, we are at the, I think we look at ourselves as ish, only thing we do actively is uh, creating a shared infra. And I'll give you some example of that uh, in terms of how that came into being uh, when we did the code stuff. Uh, and essentially the share infra is a bit like Android for a want of a better example, which is a context independent digital infra, which can be used for multiple use cases from doing a calendar app to a TikTok. And then there is a participation, which is the co-creation. How do you create diverse solutions? And that's why being a public digital platform is very important. Being open is very important. Having standards is very important, you know, so, so that other people can, you know, build easily on top of it. And those are the people who really, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we call co-creation environments. Uh, uh, and then the final layer is the, uh, what we call uh, participation layer or deployment layer, uh, which is amplification network, which is in our case, because uh, service delivery is mainly through government. It's a public service, service delivery. So we have worked with governments uh, uh, from the first mile employees who actually do the work uh, in the urban local bodies to the, you know, the service delivery layer, the part, leadership rail, the municipal commissioners, and then the state leadership, and finally the, uh, finally the, you know, the government center. And, uh, uh, and some of the amplification also happens through uh, non-profits or non-NGOs uh, who work in the local communities. In fact, Andhra, we had almost 1300, uh, you know, volunteers who used to take the public grievance uh, uh, app to the slums and actually files uh, kind of complaints on behalf of, uh, you know, uh, people there. Uh, so, so I think this is, uh, uh, this is quite important for us to, uh, to kind of communicate that unless uh, there is a participation uh, and we can make an open infra, uh, innovation at speed cannot happen. If you can flip to the next slide, Werner. So this is an example of, uh, we built in COVID in uh, 72 hours, uh, EPAS system that has been deployed by nine states. If you see this playing out uh, in, the, in the, so at the base was our digit platform, which had workflow. We had things like trade licenses, which is essentially a, a certificate to do certain things based on certain rules. We had notifications, we had workflow. We just repackaged them, if you will, like, uh, uh, like a set of uh, Lego blocks. And there were people, there were volunteers from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Make My Trip, uh, from uh, iSpirit, who had created their own, uh, who worked this infra to create solution on top of it, uh, which was the COVID e-pass uh, for, uh, for uh, essential services uh, providers to give bulk e-passes based on a trust, trusted system. We had Unilever working with us to desi design the process. And finally, the amplification actually happened through the governments. So nine states uh, came on board uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the space of, uh, you know, seven days. Uh, and I think it is very important, uh, uh, the point you made, Sudha, about what, you know, somebody can ask this question, this could have been done by a private sector player. But I think the fact that civil society or the, you know, nonprofits anchored it, it created a lot of trust in the system. The governments kind of rolled it out in, in, in a hurry. Uh, the center government approved it and a lot of market players like ey uh, pwc they worked in their respective states to help the governments roll it out so this happened in a space of 72 hours you know people uh, team of 15 people some volunteers some uh, from egov uh, yeah. worked on this uh, to, to create this so uh, so i think i think we believe uh, uh, with with the government uh, the capacity to consume technology and capacity to, even if you make the best technology, unless there's a participation by people who are really entrenched in, in communities and entrenched in, you know, uh, local context, 
uh, it will still remain a top down thing and you know uh, i believe uh, with the with the infra that we have uh, we haven't still achieved you know 10% of the potential which it might have so i'll i'll pause here i think i've run out of, run out of time uh, and take any questions later on great no thank you viraj we'll definitely come back uh, to questions uh, just 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 moving uh, right along i'd like to introduce mr ashok kamat who i don't think uh, needs much of an introduction he's the chairman and the managing trustee of akshara foundation uh, where he leads strategic planning analysis expansion of programs uh, Akshara is probably one of the you know largest and most well known NGOs in the education space. So, Mr. Kamath, it would be lovely to get your perspective on three things. One is if you could share overall, firstly, you know how have uh, you and uh, Akshara been so successful in working with government in large states and delivering public education, and how have you been uh, responding to the COVID challenge, both the short term challenge of adaptation of operations in the last six seven weeks and the long term ongoing challenge of digital access in affordable education. for this uh, under you know under proper second thank you so much kartik uh, good morning everyone uh, so uh, kartik asked me to talk about what we've been doing uh, prior to covid uh, which will lend itself to what we did during covid and what we think we should do after uh, the in the post covid era uh, prior we uh, were very clear uh, as much as uh, viraj talked about very clear that scale comes only working through the uh, public system 65% of our children go to schools in the public system and uh, these are the ones that would get uh, you know affected uh, in situations like covid very very easily so we work closely with the state uh, in fact across uh, the states of karnataka odisha and andhra approximately 100000 schools use a model that we've developed for teaching math for children between grades 1 and 5 now our model uh, leverages existing resources so teachers are there so you leverage them they need to be supplemented and empowered in many ways so we've created all those tools uh, whether they are technology based or in classroom based processes and to ensure a continuity of uh, classroom instruction in the home we also created an online property called building blocks uh, which is uh, again open source free product available uh, uh, teaches math to children uh, grades 1 through 5 structured with the curriculum the national curriculum framework and all the rest of it and available in nine indian languages so essentially we have a footprint that probably covers 80 85% of the country uh, and Uh, the product also works offline so that was an important uh, thing that we did perhaps uh, a significant part of our uh, model was the creation of local education volunteers who prior to the covid uh, you know attack were giving us approximately 2 hours per month of quality time and we have a cadre in karnataka of approximately 15000 uh, such workers uh, such uh, education volunteers right so when covid came about we had a challenge schools were shut so our people could not go out much and yet we had this you know uh, sub optimal utilization of not only our people but also this large network of uh, uh, you know education volunteers and we said we would put this to use so in the 5 6 weeks uh, that just ended uh, last yesterday uh, our people uh, the the volunteers as well as our own people have reached out to nearly 292000 households meeting uh, the households with all the social distancing norms masks and everything and advising them and uh, making them aware of the dangers of the virus and what they should be doing and so on now to make this happen we worked with approximately 14500 uh you know education department officials uh, from ddpi down to school headmasters and another 32800 uh, community members like gram panchayat members school monitoring committee members you know you know and uh, uh, panchayat development officers and so on so this uh, you know effectively has helped us reach out to a, we think conservatively about a million people if you assume five persons per household 
we've kind of uh, reached over a million people. Uh, more important, the Building Blocks app, wherever there were smartphones, we've had the parents install them so that they can keep their children engaged. Mm. Uh, and on each phone, we can anchor up to six children uh, by giving them avatars. So we think uh, upwards of 60, 70,000 children have now started to do math on a smartphone, on an entry level smartphone. So this is what we've done during the uh, downtime, you know, during the lockdown period. We are all obviously concerned like everybody else, what happens when schools reopen? Uh, we need to worry about uh, distancing, uh, you know, physical distancing norms. Uh, we also need to worry about the fact that many of these children need to come to school. If for nothing, they need to come to school to get the midday meal. Many children do depend on that midday meal. Uh, we are also aware that if you go fully online, uh, those that don't have digital access devices in their homes uh, will lose, and therefore you need to, you know, you, that digital divide will, you know, further widen. And of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the reactions could be that uh, can we have two shifts, one in the morning and one in the afternoon? And I feel uh, that. In a lot of rural communities, the last bus leaves the village at four o'clock. So it's not likely that the teacher is going to stay, you know, beyond that time. So we need to find an alternate to all of this. Uh, our idea was to uh, make this half and half, but with a twist. Uh, we are leveraging uh, the MHRD uh, has a platform called Diksha on which our content is available. Uh, and so uh, is content available from multiple other players. Okay, and uh, I'm, th I'm only talking about open source content uh, that could be used freely. Uh, so we are suggesting uh, and working out the details right now that if you have half the children in the classroom with the social distancing norms, the other half could be given homework uh, by scanning, you know, the states are printing textbooks with QR codes that if you scan that it takes you to the appropriate, uh, you know, content on the Diksha platform. So if teachers can, if you can think of uh, a class of 30, I have 15 in the class and 15 are doing homework. And in the homes, the children are basically scanning and studying. And the next day, you know, the children are reversed. And, you know, those who are at home may be in the classroom tomorrow. Now, what that does is uh, everyone gets, uh, uh, you know, the same amount of time from the teacher uh, and hopefully removes the digital divide. So where do these phones come from, right? So we are saying that uh, there's got to be a way of getting the governments not to buy them, but to lease them and create entrepreneurship in the rural communities. Because remember with all this migrant population also going back, we're going to have shortages of jobs in rural communities. So can we make some of them, uh, you know, entrepreneurs who will lease these phones to the state, to the schools in exchange for X rupees per child per month as a lease fee. And they will manage all the logistics. What are the logistics? Every day, the phones have to come back to the school for sanitization and recharging and the phones get swapped between the kids. Uh, those who are in the classroom don't get the phones. Those who are not in the classroom will carry the phones back. So we're thinking of, you know, doing a pilot of this sort to show proof of concept uh, over the next uh, few weeks and see where it takes us. Uh, really, it is important for us to not let the virus get the better of us because, uh, you know, uh, the scare is that children may drop out in large numbers if we don't do things uh, right. Uh, and, uh, you know, that would be another sign of taking more and more people into poverty. So I think education is uh, key to a robust, you know, revival and a robust future. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was uh, extremely, extremely insightful. And, uh, you know, that last point that you mentioned, it couldn't be more true. Uh, many folks are looking at healthcare, obviously, as a critical sector, but education, both for, you know, primary and pre-primary, but also skilling right? Because it also involves getting people back into their jobs. So, uh, and frankly, scaling of healthcare workers. So as a broad area, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest here. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for those remarks. And we'll come back to questions later. 
Uh, moving on to our fourth speaker, uh, uh, Ghansham Tiwari. Uh, so uh, I'd just like to quickly introduce Ghansham. Uh, Ghansham is the founder and national coordinator uh, for Parliamentarians and Innovators for India, or PII, or PI India. This is an initiative that was recently set up by Ghansham, which basically brings together a group of eminent uh, members of parliament across political parties, along with a group of impact investors uh, and innovators like Asha Impact and other funds, and uh, you know, public policy experts in healthcare. And this is essentially a committee which meets uh, once a, a week uh, and with a secretariat that uh, Ganshan has set up, which is evaluating, I would say more than uh, you know, several dozen proposals. Uh, Ganshan can tell us exactly how many, but like the ACT grants, uh, anyone who's working on something important and COVID related, and these are not just uh, you know, venture backed companies, but often NGOs, civil society initiatives in a variety of areas from data science to community health. PII is essentially connecting all of these initiatives with, uh, with uh, uh, parliamentarians who are interested in applying these in their uh, respective uh, constituencies, essentially helping these NGOs scale up. Uh, prior to this, uh, uh, Ghansham, you know, has been an alumnus of the Harvard Kennedy School and IIM Bangalore. Uh, he has worked in the policy space, advising multiple chief ministers and parliamentarians, as well as large development organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, he was the founder of the Harvard India Conference. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, Ghansham was the national spokesperson for the Samajwadi Party and uh, uh, a candidate for the parliamentary elections from Bihar in 2019. So Ganshan, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And we would love it if you could share a little bit about uh, your work at PII and how specifically some of these innovations that uh, different NGOs are working on can be scaled up in partnership with uh, MPs and other uh, government agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is great to be part of this discussion that is stirring the, the minds of people across the country and also giving a compass to everyone who's working on, on COVID across the country. And it is great to hear from, from Sudha, from Viraj, um, Ashok, you'll hear from Sandeep, uh, people who are doing phenomenal work in the face of this pandemic that is uh, shaking the foundations of how we as a society live. Um, when I started looking at, at COVID situation, this was before Government of India took notice of COVID situation. Um, I saw that that much like some of the uh, political uh, actors who are not in government, I saw that there's a major challenge coming, and we have to take up this challenge politically, uh, as enterprise, as startups, as not for profits, in a way that we can save the country from the misery that this this challenge will face, both in social life uh, for the poor and in terms of economy. So um, while my political position was clearly defined that it was uh, mindless to put the country on a lockdown with a four hour notice and then go into a, a Kirtan and Dia mode without doing anything substantial when the, the, it was staring in our face. Um, in, in February, we wasted time in Namaste Trump. In March, we wasted time in uh, ensuring that the Madhya Pradesh government falls. But that's my political position. That did not stop me from thinking about what will be the role of members of parliament in India in the face of this crisis. We have nearly 800 members of parliament uh, with their mp led fund that would have been 4,000 crores that was taken away. Yet these are people with high public standing, uh, decades of work in public life, and uh, they cover every district across the country, uh, every state across the country. So that thought, that governments are at the forefront of responding to COVID. Members of parliament have huge public standing within the scope of government. And as a result, we need to communicate a bipartisan united response to COVID. That led to form a foundation of parliamentarians with innovators for India, PIIndia.org, where the focus is, can we really bring together members of parliament across party lines? We have today um, politicians, parliamentarians from more than 10 parties, 12 states who come together every week to discuss solutions that have come from across the country to focus on COVID situation. And these solutions are really, um, while our focus was healthcare, these solutions have covered all kinds of spaces. I would uh, showcase a solution that uh, in some way I nudged with a, a team that was already working on this space, which is the case of missed vaccines in India. 
we will have probably a million kids who would miss their vaccines because of this lockdown. And this is the first time we will have such a pending backlog um, of kids missing the vaccine. Then there are uh, situations where we can use used containers to create, uh, to augment the spaces where uh, clinics are there to serve both healthcare professionals as well as patients, as well as migrants. There are, there's a case where somebody from IIT Delhi has created a, a mask, which is as good as N95 mask. And we are looking at the possibility of tying up with members of parliament, IITs across the country, IAMs, so that these IITs and IAMs become the nodal agencies where these masks can be distributed. Um, we are looking at the problem that blood banks are going to run dry and how do we need to mobilize solutions towards that. With Sandeep and several other innovators, we looked at how do we feed people in this, this situation when hunger becomes a critical thing. Uh, one challenge that I have faced in building this up is uh, obviously uh, the aspects that funds are not available is there. This is entirely a voluntary exercise. And as I raise funds towards that, we are in that phase, but um, funds have not been an issue because people have readily uh, given their time, skills and conviction to build it up. But the real challenge that I face where, where Nudge and this entire activity can play a huge role is uh, in the last five years, when I built a startup in education um, here in India, I saw that our, our canvas of innovation is limited. It is limited because it is, it is often run by engineers, bankers, CAs, um, MBAs, right? And as a result, its, its core access is technology, limited life experience, limited knowledge of social sectors, health sector, important sectors. As a result, uh, we try to solve the same uh, problem with a solution we already have. Um, so it is important for us together to collaborate and expand this canvas of what the problem is. Today, with eminent journalists, uh, Barkha and, and Faye, who was there yesterday and spoke about some of the problems. I think the problems are staring at uh, uh, us in our face. The problem is that the political leadership has, has not been beefed up sufficiently to face this situation. As we think about centralized response, we also think about the power of democracy, which is really decentralized response. So technologically, we can think about how capable our individual panchayats are or how uh, local bodies are to face this crisis. We have a tech solutions that can teach them. We can look at what is the level of knowledge that exists in medical or healthcare workers in Bihar or Eastern UP that will face a bunch of uh, the, uh, the bulk of the migrant crisis and, and can we beef that up with knowledge that exists in Maharashtra, in Karnataka? So technology can do it, but it is important that together we expand the canvas for those who are willing to solve through innovations in this uh, situation. Uh, finally, I would like to say that, that um, collectively, uh, this is a movement where I, if I take an analogy, Titanic is sinking. Titanic is the old world order, right? We can have an imagination of what the new world order will be, but what really counts is what is our role in this moment of crisis. If we take a poll position, whatever be our role, right? Be it uh, education for those who are missing education because of lack of mobile phones in their hand, be it uh, mobilizing political leadership, mobile, mobilizing the professional talent pool in India. We have 45 million people on LinkedIn and it is time while we, sw uh, we stay home, stay safe, we don't switch off. We ask everyone that what are you doing to solve a problem right now that improves lives in your local community, your uh, local area tomorrow, right? So I think collectively um, it is that moment of, of leadership as well as crisis where we have to provoke everyone politically, apolitically, citizens, professionals that what can you do beyond money to solve for this situation? And, and as these images play in front of us, uh, which is about misery of migrants, right? At one level, they may make us indifferent uh, about it because we are just seeing too many of them. But if we are empathetic, it will not make us indifferent. It should make us think. It should tell us that we need to, to step up and do something. So at PI India, um, we have done call for solutions focused on health. We will be doing soon a call for solutions focused on migrants, rural education, employment and jobs. And I would invite collaboration to do uh, what I think is the most important thing, which is a call for problems, which is uh, tying up with, uh, with organizations that have worked in a dedicated fashion a manner in specific areas to come, come on a common platform and narrate a one problem that they think that people can solve irrespective of the government and can solve in a decentralized manner. So this is the, these are the three things. I would like to take um, a couple of more minutes to play one video that just highlights how massive uh, one problem that is not in the limelight is going to become for the country that we are trying to solve.
Aparna or Karthik, if you can play the video. Let's just play that video. Aparna? Aparna, you're on mute, huh? You'll have to unmute yourself. So while uh, this comes up, and um, uh, basically what we are looking at is that how do we tackle this situation uh, where kids are going to miss vaccines? Uh, in a lot of poor areas, kids would go into these health melas where vaccines would be given. We, are, we, have, we are a global success case on immunization, but uh, will that success case remain? Depends on how we react to the situation. Um, and that's what this video will tell us. I apologize for the technical difficulties, Nishab. What we'll do is we'll share the YouTube link for the video in the chat sure. and we'll share it with all the speakers. Sure. Uh, but if you don't mind, just in the interest of yes. time, yes. we'll just quickly cover uh, Sandeep and then we can come back to the Q&A. Sure. Uh, uh, so, so Sandeep, uh, Darwani, uh, welcome. Uh, Sandeep is also associated with uh, uh, implementing some of the you know, PII projects on the ground. Just to give a brief introduction, uh, Sandeep is an engineer who turned into a social entrepreneur, who turned into a journalist, who turned into a civil society activist. So Sandeep has been active with the Delhi government's Delhi Dialogue Commission uh, and a member of the Ahmadmi Party, and basically playing the role of a facilitator between the government and civil society organizations, uh, and very, very uh, active in the COVID response in, you know, in the uh, state of Delhi. Uh, so, Sundeep, it'll be great to hear your perspective overall on what's really happening on the ground, right? Uh, what is the specific context of Delhi? There's some unique things happening here. Uh, for example, in February, a lot of the NGOs have come together for food relief. Uh, uh, so that inherent collaboration amongst NGOs was picked up on by COVID. And then, of course, the proactiveness that you guys as, as the Ahmadi Party have shown in uh, appointing people in each constituency uh, to work with these NGOs. So if you could share your overall thoughts about civil society, uh, government collaboration, Sandeep, and then specifically some of these initiatives, PII related or otherwise, that you're working on on the ground right now, which really demonstrate how civil society is working with NGOs to address uh, the COVID challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karthik. And thanks to the Nudge Foundation, Nasha, and back for inviting me here. I'm very grateful to you. And uh, I'll, I'll start with, uh, uh, with the story uh, about uh, the one that you just mentioned about the NGOs coming together. Uh, this is a story that I think is a perfect example of distributed leadership on the ground. Uh, there were riots in Delhi in, in late February. Uh, that's, that's something that we'll never forget. But uh, there, was a, there was a time in crisis when a lot of NGOs came together. Those who were uh, perhaps not, who had never done riot relief before in their lives. Uh, and, and they started serving communities who were affected by the riots. Uh, this, this, this collective is, was called Delhi Relief Collective. They, they made a WhatsApp group and little did they know that there was a COVID pandemic to follow very soon. Uh, as soon as the COVID pandemic happened, this collective was the first one that became the first response team from the civil society in, in helping out people. Uh, as as you know, we all know, the, the lockdown happened with a very, very small warning. So there, was, there, were, there were all kinds of problems that were happening uh, in, in the first few days of the lockdown. And I'm, I'm going to briefly just run through those, remind you all about those issues, and then come to the solutions that the government came up with. One of them was, of course, stranded migrants. Second one was a food shortage uh, in, in many parts. And thirdly was the health crisis, of course. Uh, in, in all three, uh, I thought that the, that the NGOs played a very critical role. I'm going to I'm going to tell you two examples of how the Delhi government has has used NGOs in a very has interwoven with NGOs to have a coherent response to the COVID crisis. Uh, the first one is that the Deputy Chief Minister himself of the state, uh, Mr. Manish Sisodia, formed an advisory group under him, which had NGO representatives in it. Uh, and, and the second example is that uh, we had one NGO representative map to each district. Of, of Delhi. So there would be perfect coordination in terms of, you know, feedback from the ground and expertise coming from NGOs inside the system. Uh, I thought that both these mechanisms were very effective in the first few days 
of the lockdown in getting not just you know high quality people inside the system but also to kind of plug gaps which would otherwise have taken far more longer uh, for the system to plug on its own uh, there there were there were some some great things that the angels did by themselves without the state and i and i have to highlight those as well uh, in this one is that uh, that the angels were uh, cooperating within themselves like i said the delhi relief collective was one of them which grew and during during the riot stage maybe there were 20 but right now there must be maybe 80 or 100 ngos in that group uh, the ngos grew in strength and the bigger ngos started working with the smaller ngos which i thought was was quite uh, was was quite something because for things like verification of of beneficiaries for direct cash transfer it was the smaller local ngos at the last mile which were able to do that very effectively uh, while some of the other ngos the bigger ones in other states were transferring the money uh, second thing is about the repatriation of migrant workers. Uh, it was it was extremely difficult for for community workers to operate in this in this environment when there was a health hazard for themselves, and uh, but but kudos to them. I think the the civil society again stepped up and and did something that's unprecedented. Uh, I hope that uh, that the work will continue because uh, we're still not even out of the lockdown yet, and we still have some way to go ahead, and and that's what I. Uh, you know, I want to thank Gansham and his team who've been, uh, who've been incredible in sourcing innovations to us. And uh, I, I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about our experience with PII. Uh, PII has, uh, has you know, kind of brought in a lot of op uh, optimistic innovators inside the system. And, and the good thing about working with these innovators is that they don't have any baggage, they're completely new, they're not from civil society or from the, from the, uh, you know, from the NGO sector. Uh, they're professionals like like Gansham just mentioned, and who wanted to change the world, who had a who had a great idea, and they wanted to step up in the times of times of crisis and do something. Uh, we've we've been able to implement a couple of innovations that have come from PII, and uh, you know the, the learnings that I have had uh, that are that you know innovators don't actually need much from the state. Uh, first thing is that they need a bunch of permissions to wait the system. They you know in, because they don't understand. The, the bureaucratic machinery, the governance mechanisms. So uh, every now and then an innovator would need a little bit of handholding to navigate and wade through the system. Uh, the second is uh, most innovators require data to operate, you know, some data points, critical data points that are not in public domain, perhaps. And lastly, I think innovators do, do have a need for, uh, for financial capacity, uh, which I think the state is very capable in connecting them with other partners. So uh, we had a really good innovation, innovator coming through from uh, PII who's going to be doing Corona simulations. Uh, and uh, of course, it's a big project, but we've been able to connect that innovator with IIT Bombay, who has received a grant from MHRD to do Corona simulations. So hopefully, innovators will plug in their resources with each other, intellectual and financial, and come up with some groundbreaking uh, products. And uh, I, I would say that in the end, uh, before I wrap up, uh, the system, the, the public delivery system itself, at times creates inequities, rather unfortunately. But these inequities can be plugged only when innovators come in at different stages, not just the last mile, but also within the system. So I, I hope that uh, not just Delhi, but even other states will start welcoming innovators within the system. And right now, our dire need is to plug gaps mainly in, 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 in the food supply machinery, because uh, as you all know, that uh, that if you know that most of the population like maybe 70 uh, to give you a number 72 lakh people in delhi are dependent on the russian system on the, on the pds system and uh, and then we've got uh, we've got an other temporary russian scheme as well which is again catering to about 10 to 12 lakh people uh, so beyond the, beyond this uh, 72 and 12 lakhs uh, delhi has a population of two two crore people 20 million people and you know we still have a lot of people who are out of the security net safety net. And that's where the innovators can play a huge role, massive role. I'll end with that and end with that and look forward to some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandeep. And thanks uh, to all of you. I think this was a very, very interesting discussion. And we've heard of a lot of examples. I've just tried to summarize uh, five key points, uh, one from each of you, uh, in terms of the five key takeaways, uh, which I'll just quickly summarize. And then we have maybe time for one or two questions. So I'll read out those questions and anyone who wants to respond can respond. So in summary, I think, uh, what are some of the key takeaways here? Number one, as Sudha mentioned, there's really a need to improve the ease of doing business. I love that phrase uh, for NGOs. 
and that NGOs are facing a difficult funding landscape. So uh, this is a very, very critical topic. Uh, as Virat said, tech is not enough. Of course, tech is critical in terms of having solutions, but it's really about the policies and ecosystems. And you also mentioned a very interesting point that often if a not-for-profit is delivering the services, it generates greater credibility than the private sector, like with your COVID pass. So NGOs are well-placed if they're tech-enabled to, to you know, collaborate and build that ecosystem. Uh, Mr. Kamath, you gave some amazing examples of the innovations that your organizations and leading NGOs are doing. And what really struck out, uh, you know, what, what really st stood out was the huge numbers involved in terms of, uh, you know, all those people in the public sector that you're able to mobilize, whether it's, uh, you know, school teachers or, or uh, community workers or so forth. And again, this emphasis on simple tech, right, but which is well delivered, which can be a, a simple smartphone, which five people can use at home. So it's really about the scale that comes with government and the efficient delivery. Um, Gansham mentioned some, some uh, amazing points about the importance of localization and decentralization, about mobilizing professionals to work on these problems, sharing of best practices, and how you do need the right type of political buy-in to enable that. Uh, and of course, Sandeep spoke further about some of those examples. And I like how you ended it, Sandeep, by saying that it's not as complicated as we think. At the end of the day, if there's an openness on the part of government, innovators just need some permissions and some data. And then this connecting of the dots, this blue between civil society and governments, precisely what all of you are working on. So it was very, very uh, insightful. And you know, uh, thank you guys for sharing all of that. I have personally have a few questions myself, but we don't have too much time. Uh, so maybe I can select one of the questions which has come in here. Uh, and really, I guess this, it's about collaboration, right? So one question is, what should be the role of the state government versus the private sector in service delivery to, to, to citizens? Is it a case of balance or is it a case of the government becoming more of an enabler and moving more towards private, private provision? Because often sometimes people say that the private sector shouldn't be involved in certain things, right? And there's a confusion. Do you mean the for-profit private sector or the not-for-profit private sector? So perhaps if uh, each of you can just maybe give a short closing comment on overall what you see as the role of the state, if you were to advise, you know, your state government, uh, what should they do? Uh, if we can just maybe go across and have each of you share, you know, uh, your closing thoughts, that would be helpful. So does music to my ears to hear Gansham and Sandeep speak uh, and this question that falls right in. I think the role of the state government is to actively scout for innovations and new ways of solving old problems. COVID has provided that wonderful inflection point in which this has become possible. Uh, not just people that have made it their lives work to solve problems as nonprofits, but also probably innovators who will do it for short bursts of time. Uh, I think the government has a responsibility to scout for these actively through channels like PII um, uh, and bring it into public systems, supporting with money where needed. And maybe even make a budgetary allocation in this financial year uh, for such innovations, not leave it to serendipity. That's a great idea, Ganshan. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think this is truly, um, uh, while the Prime Minister spoke about uh, being vocal about local, but truly this is a hyper-local moment of India, uh, where uh, because of uh, social distancing, travel issues, uh, each uh, village is its own mini-republic, or each town is its own mini-republic, and one can look at the, the skill pool of that village, the resource pool available, uh, the idea pool available, you can think about um, something as simple as LinkedIn groups for each member of parliament that focus on that particular district, that, that particular constituency. And as a result, the role of the state is really to, to be uh, the incubator of ideas, but it is eventually the products and services have to be locally deployed by local people. If collectively all of us with our effort in the next one month, let us say identify one good not-for-profit or for-profit or a team uh, that is working in one block across the country, right, uh, across more than 700 districts that we in India have, right, that would be huge service because we, we give that that um, team uh, not for profit, for profit credibility, they, they become the engines of that hyper local uh, setup in India. And it, it suddenly changes the, the, the vantage point with which we operate uh, from the point of doing something end to end, to doing something to the end that will deliver eventually. 
Absolutely. Viraj, uh, Mr. Kamath, anything you guys wanted to add? Yeah, so let me just, uh, you know, take it in a more concrete manner. So if you take, a, you know, this Android app that we talked about, the building blocks, right? So it required funding from the corporate sector. In this case, it was Cisco to create, to help us create that problem, uh, the, the product, right? Then when it comes to delivery, you need multiple channels. The state government pitched in by printing textbooks. So to give you a sense in June uh, of 2020, uh, across four states, 33 million textbooks would have QR codes that will link it to this. Okay. So that's a, that's a large, uh, uh, you know, uh, reach, if you will. Right. And, uh, to make that happen, we had to unbundle things so that it's uh, you know aligned chapter by chapter to the text. So, so there's that little bit of work. During the COVID time, when education volunteers go door to door, you know that's the last mile delivery that's important. So, I think you need to be able to take all of these in a you know we've done it across one state at this point, uh, and of course the Diksha platform is across four states, but nothing to prevent uh, all things going across the entire country. I think I think uh, uh, in, in, when you look at service delivery over a, over a longer period of time, uh, I think the government's role has to be, I think two, and that's a common across any any uh, delivery. I would say first is creating some foundational infrastructure. I mean, you take highways as an, as an example. You know, government builds the highways, then puts the policies around who pays for it, what is the revenue share, uh, what are the specs for building it. So I think creating foundational infra is quite important. I think that's something government is uniquely placed to do because it needs uh, investment and it needs certain uh, kind of, uh, and linked to that is policy. You know, can you create enabling policies? You know, I think some of the things we have had so many innovators come to us saying, we want to build something on top of it. But can the government procure it? You know, can there be a policy around procuring small startups and, you know, testing those things out? So I think unless there's a, enabling policies uh, that government creates. You know, we had wonderful, you know, there's Smart Lou, you guys know from, uh, from Nudge Foundation, right? Uh, he's got a wonderful solution to smartify the toilets and he can use our infra to build. But really for the government to procure it and scale it, it is extremely hard with the current procurement policies. So I think uh, one of the key things government should solve for, and COVID is a great example of, you know, some of the unsolved policy issues actually coming the way, right? To actually do things quickly. So, so I think unless exactly. some of the policy uh, roadblocks are removed and you have enabling policies, recognizing that you need to have local innovation, right? Just, just getting innovators together may not actually solve problem. In a crisis, it might because, you know, everybody has a gun on their head. But on a long-term basis, it'll be extremely hard in my mind. So I think policies and infra. I mean, Diksha is a great example of infra. It's a infra that government has provided. Yeah. It's a standard infra that any educator who has content can use it to promote their, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 content. And that's, that gives you scale across the country. So those are the two points I want to make. Wonderful. Well, uh, look, uh, we're right on the hour. So I wanted to once again thank all of you. And that last point, uh, Viraj, that you made is a perfect segue into our next session, which I hope you will uh, all stay around for, which is a keynote session uh, moderated by uh, Pramod Basin, along with two speakers from the policy world, uh, Jasmin Shah from the Delhi Dialogue Commission and Mr. Deepak Singhal. Uh, IAS, who was the former chief secretary of UP. So right after this, in fact, we're going to be looking at some of those policy issues. And uh, again, I'd like to thank all of you for being part of this discussion to discuss how NGOs and civil society can partner with government. And now we'll uh, listen to the perspective from the government of